everybody. It's good to see you all again. And what we're going to talk about today is going to be working with Gaia data. This is an introduction to using data from the Gaia satellite. And so today what I hope you can accomplish will be to give you some introduction to what Gaia is and why it's so useful. So we'll use this as an introduction to observational data, and then we'll get into more details as we study those properties of stars in the coming weeks. <clears throat> Critically, we're going to introduce a new tool for our data set, and that is the GLUE software tool, which allows us to visualize catalog and image data. It's going to be very useful for doing a lot of the analysis that we're working with over the coming semester. So our goals today are to grab some data on a nearby star cluster and link the data to uh, from an image and a catalog, and then figure out a cluster where that cluster of star is using proper motion, and ultimately to characterize the distance to that uh, cluster using uh, the Gaia data. So. Gaia is the, short for the Global Astrometric Interferometer for Astrophysics, uh, a fairly um, tortured name to produce the Gaia acronym, though uh, I'm hardly one to talk in this field. And it's a mission that's been launched by the European Space Agency. So ESA shows up in a lot of uh, materials, and a big thanks to them for all of their open images that they've uh, uh, produced that I show in this video. So it's a objective is to measure the locations and motions of 1 billion stars in our galaxy. It's an amazingly uh, challenging mission. This is a map of the Gaia sky as seen by Gaia in what they call Data Release 2, DR2. Uh, oh, since 2013, Gaia has been staggering out its data releases as they get better and better at understanding the results from this mission. What you see here isn't an image of the sky. It is instead the locations and colors of a billion stars that are just plotted onto the sky, producing almost exactly what we would see if you took a whole sky image uh, altogether. But this is nonetheless the core of the astronomical data from the Gaia mission. It is targeted at understanding the stars and stellar populations in our galaxy. And since these form the backbone of our galaxy, the dominant constituent of, of baryonic or regular matter in our galaxy is the stars, this tells us a ton about galaxies and why we're focused on it. What Gaia is doing is a relatively simple targeted mission. It is just telling us everything we can about 1 billion stars. For those, Gaia precisely, very precisely measures the positions of those stars over time, their brightnesses in three bands, their parallax, which is the positions over time, the proper motion, which is another position over time, and then the radial velocities of the stars using spectroscopy. The coordinates of the Gaia data show up in this right ascension and declination system that we introduced in the observation uh, lecture. We should remember that right ascension, or RA, is a longitude-like coordinate, and declination, also abbreviated as DEC, is a latitude-like coordinate, and they describe the positions of stars on this celestial sphere in angular coordinates. The brightnesses of the stars are measured in the specific Gaia passbands. There are only three uh, passbands for most of the data that Gaia has used. Uh, G is the green or uh, Gaia passband, which covers almost all of the optical, 400 to about 900 nanometers pretty well. And then that's subdivided into two bands, the blue band and the red band, because stars have different colors. And so we'll measure the relative brightnesses in these three bands and use it to infer the properties of the stars. These are brightnesses are expressed in magnitudes, uh, which is has this logarithmic base 10 scale where smaller numbers correspond to brighter stars. And we are using the we are using the Gaia data to infer the intrinsic absolute magnitudes through a combination of the apparent magnitudes and the parallaxes, which gives us the power radiated by the star. 
The parallax that Gaia is measuring is just the apparent motion of the star with respect to the background objects caused by seeing the uh, star from different sides of the Earth's orbit. The Gaia mission is in orbit around the Earth, so it travels with Earth around the Sun. Uh, and so we're able to see stars at these different perspectives, but it's a satellite, so it's not uh, affected by having observations clouded out or the intrinsic angular resolution limit for ground-based observatories from the turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. Instead, it has full astronomical uh, precision that you would expect for its optical system. The parallax just comes from measuring the apparent displacement angles over the course of the year and uh, measuring how these uh, change through trigonometry uh, gives us the distances to the stars. Gaia also, through measuring the coordinates of objects over time, is measuring the proper motions. And so this will measure the tangential velocities of uh, stars on the uh, celestial sphere. So star, uh, the component of the motion that's perpendicular to our line of sight measured to the galaxy. Uh, Gaia will traditionally report uh, observations in uh, proper motion in the right ascension units with a cosine declination term already applied. So these are now equal size uh, observations and are measured as displacements in the tangent plane to the celestial sphere at the location of the star. The perpendicular velocity can be then measured uh, through converting some units and the distance to the star through parallax as 4.74 times the distance in parsecs times the proper motion measured in arc seconds per year gives you an answer in kilometers per second. Gaia also has a spectrometer on it that is measuring in this particular band, uh, 84, uh, 845 to 870 nanometers or 8450 to 8700 angstroms. Uh, this is a particularly line rich portion of the spectrum uh, and so stars over a bunch of different uh, temperatures and abundances will have spectral lines in this feature that Gaia can measure with high precision their observed uh, wavelength uh, uh, relative to their known wavelength and use that through the Doppler formula here to infer the radial velocity. In total, you have to remember that the combination of the position of the stars, the distance the para through the parallax, the proper motion, the brightnesses in the three colors, the radial velocities, all of these give us the brightnesses of the stars and their position in six-dimensional phase space, which is three spatial dimensions, which is the right ascension, declination, and distance, give us a spherical polar coordinate system that we can move it into three dimensions, and then three dimensions in velocity, where the proper motion gives us two and the radial velocity gives us one. Now, not all measurements are available for all objects because of the limitations of the observatory. We hit just the fundamental limits of the optical system. Some stars are just too faint to measure their spectra to get a radial velocity. So not everything has a perfect measurement over time. But there are nonetheless tons and tons of data. This has expanded by orders of magnitude the number of stars that we know where there are. It has been a transformative mission in astrophysics, and it is releasing data right now. We're going to study it. So this little diagram here, produced by ESA, has some indication of what all is in a Gaia data release. Data release 3 is the most recent data release. It was released over the summer and it has 1.8 billion stars in it. Uh, this is a huge number, very challenging to store all of this information and this database. What we get out of this is broken down in all of these diagrams here. So we have uh, for one and a half billion stars, we have astrometry, which is their location, and their photometry. So we have distances and proper motions, brightnesses, and colors. So this gives us a basic information about what kind of stars there are. Uh, we're also able to measure the radial velocity for 33 million stars. It's a much lower number. So we have to remember that those radial velocity measurements are really just a tiny subset of the overall population. 
Gaia also gets us a lot of different information because not all stars are just single stars like the Sun. Uh, we can measure the decomposition of several hundred thousand, uh, eight hundred thousand uh, binary stars or multiple star systems that are in orbit around each other. We can see their observations. Uh, uh, individually. Uh, we measure the changing brightness over time for 10 million stars. Those are variable stars that are intrinsically fluctuating in brightness. And then we have spectroscopy here for many objects. And even if we can't measure the radial velocity, we can see the depths of their spectral lines. And this gives us their surface temperatures, chemical compositions, uh, sizes, all through topics that we'll learn about later. So really useful for later studies. We're going to observe, or we're going to use the Gaia data set in the GLU uh, visualization software. This is going to be a, a nice tool that knows about astronomical data to do a little bit of analysis. This tool is built on top of Python. So we are going to be able to use Python for some numerical analysis a little later on, though what we're covering today is all about the uh, visualization. So you should install Glue on your computer uh, to do this data analysis. Uh, the URL for that is shown up there. It's gluevis.org. And if you go there or use the link off of eClass, that will take you to uh, the page where it will give you an installation follow the instructions, and get the software. So now what we're going to do is get some data off of eClass. If you look under the observational data, that gives you a link to a Google Drive. And in that Google Drive, you'll find two files on a star cluster called the Pleiades. So this is an image file and the Gaia, Gaia data in the same region. The image is going to cover a region something like this. The Pleiades is an asterism. It's a group of stars. Uh, they are all coeval. Uh, they were born together. So coeval is C-O-E-V-A-L, meaning co-evolutionary, uh, not like both evil, like bad. Um, so they're coeval, so they're all evolving together and they were born together and they're moving through the galaxy together. And we're gonna use that latter fact to find all of these stars. This is a big image of it, and the image that we'll study is covering this region, and then the Gaia data is a slightly larger region uh, over this. So now we are going to dive into using these two data files. Uh, these actually summarize the two primary files that we have in astrophysics. Uh, we generally produce either catalogs, so these are essentially spreadsheet-like data showing uh, properties of objects, uh, and you basically say, here's an object, here's all the things I've measured about it as the columns of your spreadsheet. Then we can look at the images, which are just pictures of the sky, and astronomical images are metadata. Uh, contain metadata. And that metadata tells you what kind of image it is, where it is on the sky, the coordinate system that it's using, and how the um, how to interpret the actual data file. Like when you take a picture on your phone, it embeds metadata. Like what time was this picture taken? If you're using your phone, it's uh, probably embedding the GPS location of the uh, file, tells you uh, all the properties about uh, the image so it can be interpreted later. Our data files are kind of twofold. One, you've probably used before. That's a CSV file or a comma separated values file. It's basically a spreadsheet. If you have Excel or Google Sheets, you always see a CSV file as one of the export options. The one thing you may not have used is a FITS file, and this is an astro-specific file format. And FITS is an acronym short for the Flexible Image Transport System. So FITS actually can contain both image and catalog data. Uh, we'll probably end up using both. Uh, and it's stored differently. And then it has all this information in it uh, in what's called a header, which contains a bit of metadata. We'll look at headers a bit later, but for today, we don't need to do it. Uh, so what we're gonna do is actually do some glue use and walk you through it. This is sort of a step-by-step -step that reproduces one of your homework uh, uh, problems. So I hope that you'll be able to follow along at home. 
Okay, when you open up Blue, you'll get a window that looks something like this. Uh, the main action all happens here in what's called the canvas, which is where we have a bunch of uh, tools that we'll be manipulating. Up here is where we'll get information about the data that we've loaded in. Uh, these are some control windows where we'll manipulate stuff in the canvas. Uh, some save export functionality here. And then over here uh, is a terminal button, which shows that we're operating on top of Python. So we can do some Python-like stuff uh, if we're interested in that and uh, use it as our most expensive world's, uh, world's most expensive desktop calculator. And I can just close that and have it go away inside my canvas. So to get started, I will go into my computer and I will just drag uh, my two files into the glue window. Uh, both of these are the Pleiades uh, files. And I'll drag and drop. And that will bring them up here. And you'll notice that this loads up the files in these data collections. So uh, we can see Pleiades results is the Gaia data. So I'll pop it over there. And when I do that, uh, drag it into the data file, I get a little data viewer window. And it asks, how do you want to deal with this? I'm going to start out by saying, show me a table viewer. And what that does is it gives me basically a spreadsheet uh, where it tells me everything that's in the file. Source ID, MG, G, mean, mag. We'll talk about these in a minute. Uh, BPRP. All of these are the basic files, uh, uh, all the basic data inside a Gaia uh, data file. So that includes a bunch of useful tags. I'm just going to go over them briefly now and then call back to them. Uh, that looks a little something like this. So uh, source ID is a big long number that is the Gaia unique identifier for a single source. Could be a galaxy, could be a star, uh, could be an asteroid, all these things. Um, MG is the absolute magnitude in the Gaia G band. Uh, FOT G mean mag is the apparent magnitude in the G band. Recall that that's the full optical band. Uh, BP sub RP is the blue minus red color of the object. Parallax and parallax error are the parallax angle. And this is the important thing about Gaia. They natively express everything in milli arc seconds because most stars have milli arc second parallaxes and associated uncertainties. RA deck, probably can guess. PMRA, PM deck, these are the proper motions. Remembering the RA direction embeds the cosine declination term. Associated uncertainties, radial velocities that we have, kilometers per second, and associated uncertainty. Uh, e, BP minus RP value, this is a measurement of the reddening of the uh, um, object through dust. So it's a characteristic of uh, dust. AG is the dust extinction inferred. So we'll learn more about dust as we go forward. LB are the galactic longitude and should say latitude. And ECL is the ecliptic longitude and latitude, which is measured with respect to the Earth's orbit, not with respect to the Earth's uh, orientation. I include these, but we don't use them too, too much. So returning to glue, we see all of those files here. So this uh, goes through. And we see that whatever, Gaia source 68629, all this mess has a uh, Gaia G band magnitude of uh, 3.82. So, relatively bright star. It's the brightest star of the 11 that we see here. And as you go off, these are all the values. So, that's what's actually in the, data, uh, the Pleiades results data file. Yeah, I don't need a table anymore. Then if I grab this other one, Pleiades DSS B band, I want to grab the primary, uh, which is the main image. And it will ask me, what do you want that to be? And it's, that's a 2D image. So I'm going to pop it up. And there's an image of the sky. It looks exactly like what I showed you earlier. Uh, over here, suddenly we get a bunch of information that we can, uh, uh, ways to manipulate this. We can say that we want to get some kind of weirder colors on this part of the sky, maybe make it look a little like uh, what we saw there. We can um, 
maybe yeah, I don't know. Let's let's go back to regular black and white uh, parts of the sky. Uh, we can uh, do some changes. We don't have to really worry too much about this. If I was super wild, I could tip the scale of the image around or something. Uh, but I'll go back to it being a right ascension and declination bit. And I'm going to shrink that down just so I have a little bit of space to work with. Uh, the other stuff here. So that gives me uh, an image of the sky in right ascension and declination space. And you notice this is hours, minutes, seconds, and then degree, minutes, seconds uh, on the axes. Uh, so we can measure units uh, here. And then uh, what I want to do is actually I want to connect these two data sets. Uh, now, if we look at the Pleiades result, it's just a table of RA and DEC values. Uh, this is some image with a coordinate grid associated with it. And if I want to connect these two uh, together so I can work with them together, I'm going to go up to the link data button right here. I'm going to link, and that pops up a window that looks like this. And I want to say, oh, these are the things I want to link. I want to link the Pleiades results to the DSS B band. Uh, and that will give me uh, that connection. And this will give me everything in those two uh, files that it knows about. And we just have to say that RA means right ascension. And then we can glue these together. That's basically the cool thing that this software does that nothing else does. Similarly, DEC and DEC, we can glue those together. They're the same thing. So now these data sets are linked on their coordinate axes. And then I can do something kind of cool. I can grab the Pleiades results. I'm going to uh, go ahead and just drag it in to this file. And that shows a little gray dot everywhere the files are. And if I really want to see that better, I can change my image to not be... Let's make it something nice and clear. There we are. Uh, and so now I can see that lots of stars here have a little dot on top of them. So you can go and look in more detail, and you'll see that this big bright star, in fact, has a big dot on it. If I just think that that's terrible, I can double click on the Pleiades results key and say, I don't want that. I want, oh, I don't know, something my feeble eyeballs can see. And then say that. And then now, oh, that's super visible. And you can really see every one of these uh, stars has a dot on it. Well, not everyone. Some of them don't. And in fact, the Gaia results really only present places where they have the best observations. Some of these things are, in fact, too bright for Gaia to get a good measure on. Uh, but a lot of these stars have the dots on them. So it shows that they're actually measuring objects in this image. These are fundamentally different in, uh, data types. Uh, one's a catalog with just, you know, RA and deck values. The other one's just a bunch of pixels and with metadata that tells you how to map that into right ascension and declination. The cool thing that Glue allows us to do, we don't need that anymore, goodbye, is to actually plot your data sets in uh, other ways. And so if I drag this in here and I pull up my data viewer, I can just make an XY plot. And so I say, give me a scatter plot, and it just sort of picks some values, uh, absolute magnitude versus source ID, because those are the first two entries in the catalog, but that's not useful. Let's actually go and select RA and DEC out of that. And that gives me the right ascension and declination of uh, all the sources in the file. And you can see that there's some notches out of it. That A lot of that has to do with how Gaia collects data. And it's not very, it hasn't quite sampled all of the good results uh, right here. And we get something that looks like those horrible, horrible colorblindness detection uh, things. And then you can click and you can manipulate uh, your uh, things. You can make your plot symbols bigger or smaller. You can uh, change their size uh, if you want to scale each size based on its magnitude and then switch the limits and then um, make them smaller. Suddenly all the big file, all the big sources here are the brightest sources and then the faint sources are smaller. You can sort of see that. Big sources are bright, 
paint sources are smaller. We'll use that technique later. We don't really need it. I'm just illustrating kind of the things you can do in this plot. Uh, you can attach error bars if you want to do it. Uh, and then um, if you need to change like the axes or the limits, if you want to relabel these as right ascension because you don't need gobbledygook and declination, uh, suddenly you can manipulate your plot a little bit, make things a little bigger in your plot axes. And if you want to, you can enable a uh, legend to show what data set it is. Um, and, you know, basically manipulate the plot as you see fit. So it's a lot like working with a spreadsheet uh, plotting program, but we have very astronomically relevant uh, data uh, or tools that we can use. Uh, so what we actually want to do is, well, we'll put that on hold here. So this basically got everything in that part of the sky. Uh, we can take a look at the data file in a different plot. And what we can do is change it. And what I'm going to use next is a histogram. Uh, and what that does is it shows the one-dimensional distribution of a data set. So I can uh, look at, say, the parallax. And so this gives me all the parallax measured here in the sources. Uh, looks like there's some data out here. There's like, you know, 18,000 sources here. So let's uh, take the log of that, and that essentially shows the logarithmic distribution there. And then I can also take the log in the vertical direction if I want to see all the way out. And sure enough, there's a few sources out here that are out at 30, parall 30 milli arc seconds parallax. And I can actually identify those. Uh, I can, this is, this is the cool thing that Glue does, is it links visualization. And I say, give me all of those sources. I select this little band. I select a horizontal interval, and it brings up what's called a subset. It's the individual sources with that property. So here's where those four sources with a parallax of around 30 milli arc seconds are in the field. If I don't want that subset uh, anymore, I can just uh, click on it and remove. It takes it off the file. And if I don't want it in my analysis, I can just, uh, uh, I think I need to, oops, I need to, uh, yeah, well. Let's just remove the layer, delete layer. That's the button I was looking for. Okay, so now it's gone. We don't care about those parallaxes anymore. Uh, so this shows that there's not much, there's just a nice distribution of parallaxes uh, here. Nothing that would sort of indicate there's a group of stars all at a common distance, uh, just sort of uh, goes uh, jaggy up and down. The way we're actually going to find those stars is that using the statement that I made, which is, all those, or find the cluster, is going to rely on all those stars are moving together. And if they're moving together, they'll have what's called a common proper motion. And so I can take my common proper motion uh, by looking at the proper motion in the right ascension direction and the proper motion in the declination direction. And that just gives us a big cloud of points. I don't want that to be linear. Let's make it that size. And then what I can do is sort of zoom in. I click on this little magnifying button. And I want to take a look at that distribution of points. And this is really kind of neat uh, because you see there's this big cloud of stars out there. And then you have a little cluster of stars down here. That is the Pleiades. And that is what I want to grab. So I'm going to zoom in some more. And there, oops, can't really see that. Let's make them, the markers bigger. That group of stars is the Pleiades. Uh, and it just basically says all the stars from the Pleiades are moving in right ascension at 20 milli arc seconds per year. Uh, in the plus RA direction, and in the declaration direction in the minus 46 uh, direction, uh, or milli arc seconds per year. So if I want those stars, I can go ahead and just draw a rectangle around them. So I'll select this. This is my subset creation tool, and I just grab that region right there. Boop. And so that selects everything in that tool set. And if you pop down here to the parallax, you'll notice that there's suddenly this big jump up right here at 
well, it looks to be about eight arc seconds. And so we're finding something that's concentrated both in proper motion space and in parallax space. So these are all stars at a common distance that are moving in a common direction. So we can take that, and actually it's kind of neat because we can see that uh, direction if we look on uh, our map again. So let's pop out a uh, Pleiades image. Oops. I need to just drag it into the regular canvas, not into an individual image. I want a 2D image. I click that off screen, but it's the same thing as before. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop all of the Pleiades in there. That pops all those stars in there. Those, plot, uh, those points are way too big. So if I click on the, sorry, the Pleiades results, I can uh, reduce their size. So I'm not completely overwhelmed. And then you see the green ones are the ones that we've identified as part of the cluster. And sure enough, those bright stars uh, show up as being part of the cluster. So then uh, what I can do, this is kind of cool, is attach vectors to each of these. And so right now it just says the right ascension declination uh, vectors. It's plotting uh, source ID versus source ID. Not helpful. But I want that PMRA and I want that PM dec. Boop. And I need to make it a little bigger. And I want that to be the tail of the error. So that should show it. Oh, you can sort of see one right here. They are pretty big. Uh, and so that shows all the random velocity vectors here. So uh, it just shows that stars are going off in some direction. But what's kind of cool is if you notice, all of the green stars have their velocity vectors pointed in the same direction. Go, go, right there, going, going. So uh, we run into a little bit of challenge because there's some very large proper motions here in visualizing that. So I'm going to uh, actually shut that off. And I'm just going to put the Pleiades subset in there. And then I'm going to uh, plot its results. Oop. And so actually what I'm going to do is drag and drop just the subset in there. Uh, which will give me a different set of results. And then I can put its proper motions on there, PMRA and PM deck. And uh, I should shut off those stars. I want those shown at the tail of the vector and give me an arrow. And sure enough, there's everything we kind of hoped for heading off towards uh, uh, in the right ascension and declination space of uh, this, everything is flowing off in one direction. So that's just showing that we have a common proper motion, which is really pretty uh, neat. Uh, and the stars are all going in one direction if they're part of the Pleiades. Yes, I'd like for that to go away. And so now what I want to do is come back and plot uh, in one dimension what the parallaxes are. So I ask you in the homework to calculate the distance to the uh, Pleiades. So you need to know what the parallaxes are. I'm going to create a one-dimensional histogram. And you'll notice I went into subset 2 and grabbed the Pleiades results subset 2. So I'm only plotting things in that subset. Create a one-dimensional histogram. And again, it gives me source ID, not useful. But then I can go and make a parallax plot again. And there's this big booming spike here at uh, around eight. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly what that is, uh, where it is. And that's because I only have 15 bins here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually increase that to 150 bins. And suddenly we get this beautiful little well-resolved spike. Uh, and I can zoom in on that and take a look. And that gives me an average value of the parallax to the Pleiades. And I'll leave it to you to infer what kind of the average value of the parallax is to the Pleiades in milli arc seconds, and then use that to calculate the distance to this cluster. So that's a long, full exposition of the Glue Toolkit. I hope that gives you everything you sort of uh, need to know to get started. We'll be using a lot of these tools uh, again and again through the semester. So. 
Make sure you post any questions you have to the Discord, uh, and uh, we can also talk about them in class. If you have a laptop and want to just walk through stuff, uh, always happy to help with that or uh, on Zoom. So uh, be in touch and we can uh, sort out any issues that you have. Okay, that's all I wanted to talk about today. Let's uh, return to the fine world of uh, presentations and bid you a fond adieu.